Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. We've got a bit of a special guest today and a new segment. So we welcome back Sam from FTX. So first of all, thanks for joining us, Sam. Thanks for having me. And FTX are running one of the first IEOs of this year. Now, if you're new, an IEO is an initial uh, exchange offering. So a way for new projects to raise funds and get awareness and, and users. I was very skeptical towards the end of the last IEO season when every exchange started doing them after Binance sort of came out with the idea. So yeah, with this new show, I guess I want to ask some hard hitting questions to the team. Hopefully the, the first cabs off the rank are the better projects and after digging into this one I, I do think it is more legitimate but we're still going to ask the hard questions and give you guys a really well informed discussion so you can make your own decisions about what you think about the project so i'm looking forward to that. all right okay so i guess to start off with um the reasons that you chose to do it what made you go down this path you must have so many things that you're juggling at ftx already what made you want to go down the io path yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we sort of went back and forth on it uh, for a while, but whether we actually wanted to do it and, you know, sort of one of the reasons to do it is people seem to like them. Like there's there's sort of a lot of attention on them, a lot of demand from people are always asking us, you know, when 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 IEO. Um, on the other hand, I think a lot of them make no sense. And, and I think you're sort of alluding to that too. And, and like, you know, th- there's sort of a question, I think, whenever you do something like an IEO of like, why aren't, why isn't it just an open market, you know? If you like want to allow trading for a thing, why don't you just have normal open trading for a thing with an order book and see what happens? Like, why do you have this weird restricted thing? Like, that seems like economically inefficient, and it seems like it's got to be doing something weird with some weird purpose uh, that sort of relies on inefficiency. That that that's I think sort of like a pretty decent prior on IEOs. I think it's it's sort of right about a lot of them. Um, and so I think that that's sort of like what we're going back and forth with about. Um, and I. Uh, and, and and I think in the end we sort of felt like on the fence, honestly, about whether doing them made sense at all. But that if it did, we wanted it to be a project that sort of was a good fit, a project that made sense in in the FTX ecosystem, and a project that we believed in, and that we thought I uh, we were sort of excited to highlight because we thought not only was it a good project, but it was something that we thought our users would uh, sort of benefit from from knowing about. And and so th- that's sort of what will push us over the edge with uh, with Serum sort of as as the first test IEO. Absolutely, and I guess for for some of the new viewers to rewind even further, ICOs themselves when they first started were some of the best projects like Maker, and that then got out of proportion yeah. and taken over by greed and hysteria as well. So I kind of liked the maturation a, a step further to at least just get rid of the scams, if nothing else, with exchanges having right. some responsibility. But now we've had this move to like DeFi and yield farming and liquidity launches on Uniswap. And I think that's getting a bit out of control for a number of reasons as oh, well. Yeah. So we're kind of taking it back a notch, I feel. Yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. And, and I think that, that the liquidity mine makes no sense. And I think basically what happened there was, you know, Compound, I think is a really cool project. And I know I've said this a bunch before, but it's just super slick. And like, I, I think really my favorite part of it is, the, is the, the governance and voting. It's it's fully on chain, but it feels centralized. It feels like it just works. You know, it feels like, oh yeah, I'm just like writing some stuff up and sending it to, to Rob and, and, you know, He's gonna go meet with Calf and be like, all right, yeah, let's go, let's go roll this out now. But but in fact, you're submitting a smart contract to another smart contract that'll modify a smart contract if a set of smart contracts vote by sending tokens to a smart contract to to implement it, and then automatically after two days, you, you know, I, I, I think it's like really cool how they built a fully on-chain, fully generalizable government governance system uh, that that just feels slick and, and intuitive to use. Um, and I think that they had a kind of reasonable idea, which was like, you know, we want to distribute some comp tokens to the community and we also want to sort of like jumpstart the protocol. So yeah, I don't know what if we sort of drop them on people who use the protocol, you know, sort of like accomplish both at once. And and I think they set it up. So it's like, you know, 5% a year or something like that interest for parking capital there, which I think is like a really reasonable thing to do. You know, it's like, look, we understand you're tying up capital doing this. We want to sort of like compensate you for that so that we can sort of jumpstart this phase where maybe there aren't enough borrowers or aren't enough lenders and get everyone together. And also we sort of like getting some some of the tokens out into the open to decentralize it. The problem was that uh, their token went up 10x and the amount that they're dropping was not a number of dollars of their token, it's a number of tokens. Yes. So now all of a sudden, instead of paying like five 
percent it's like 50 percent really 100 percent at the beginning and that's not an economically reasonable number that's like a very big number that's the sort of number that just like swamps everything else is you just get a lot of people lending to themselves uh on compound in order to get this token and you get this ridiculous situation where yeah. like projects are dropping upwards of a million dollars a day worth of their tokens on users to self-trade to build hype around their project to increase the value of their token which then increases uh, the airdrops which makes more people self-trade which then gets in this positive feedback loop and it's very much like trans mining and it, it, that that's going to burst like that that's not sustainable 100 percent. i did a video the other day about DeFi and the bubble and you, i think you're alluding to projects like wi-fi that start off with the you know that, that say 10 token right. reward and that's fine when the token is 40 cents yeah and once the token becomes a thousand dollars then you start to see oh apy a hundred percent and all these noobs are piling in and it's just sort of a yeah. house of cards that's going to come undone yeah, exactly. Whenever you see a pure no risk APY that's like way bigger than 10%, you should be a little skeptical because like 10% is like the crypto interest rate. You know, that's like if you want to borrow money in crypto, I don't know, maybe 5%, maybe 20%, maybe 25% depending on what you're borrowing. You know, those are sort of the numbers that you would throw out for like cost of capital and, and risk and, and, and assets in crypto. Um, when we're talking about like 80%, that like that that's not yield that's that's hyperinflation like that's a different thing or, or i would say the other argument is that if it stays at something like 30 percent, 50 percent, then you've got to acknowledge that it's smart contract risk liquidity risk right. all, oh, yeah. all these other things it's it's high for a exactly. reason so yeah right and with a lot of the wi-fi things like i think there's a sense of like oh these are great investments if they're not a scam i don't know which ones are scams you know that that's what that's what this yield is baking in and and you know as it turned out wi-fi was not a scam Wi-Fi I was not a scam, but one of the third tier Wi-Fi things was a scam. One of the next 10 clones you know. would probably be a scam. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's probably something to take out of this whole new segment we want to do. It's people's intentions. I've got no problem with experimentation and all that kind of thing. And I think we're going to get a feel for the guests as they come on and do this show about what their intentions are. So let's dive into it then, Sam. So in a nutshell, I guess I would view Serum as a another attempt to make a multi-chain uh, DeFi sort of DEX trading platform. So how right. would you put it? Yeah, I mean, in some sense, I think that's true. What is it? You take a DEX and you take cross-chain functionality, and then you tack on a bunch of obvious shit like tokenized products. Um, and in some sense, that's what it is, and it looks sort of very similar to all the other things that are described like that. Um, and, and what makes it different than that, or what, what do I think will make it different than that, um, it's that it's not sort of doing it randomly. It's not choosing like a random cross-chain thing and a random DEX and a random tokenized product and trying to glue them together with a random protocol. Um, it's sort of starting from the beginning of like, what's the best product you can build in DeFi? And it's like, well, you want an actual, you know, ecosystem with the products people like, like order books, you know, and like orders that cost less than a dollar to send and clear in less than a minute. And, 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 and you know, you start to say like, what are what are the products people actually want to exist? And a lot of them just don't exist. And they, you know, they don't exist because Ethereum can't support an order book, it can't support a matching engine. It, it costs a dollar in a few minutes, but um, uh, but you don't want that. But it's also where everything is. So you know, what do you do? And and that's where the cross chain part comes in. You build it on a fast chain, and you have cross chain bridges to tie it into Ethereum and other popular ecosystems. And and I think the thing that sets it apart, apart is just trying to do the right job at all of that. So it's not just choosing a random chain. It's using what, what we, we found to be like the fastest stable chain that there is. And it, it is a fully public chain. It's not like a, a sort of layer two thing that we're just making up. Um, it's a decentralized blockchain that anyone can use, but it's, it's really fucking fast. It's 10,000 times faster than Ethereum. So, so it can actually support. I was yeah. going to say, I may be jumping there to for the people at home to uh, stay up with where we're going because we've you've thrown a lot of things at us at once there which is great i had them all as the talking points but yeah DeFi, fast growing space you know dexes trading all these things have a lot of users it's growing I, I really like that about it all and the question now becomes the bleeding edge of the space is well how do we scale and there's different projects like synthetics using optimistic roll-ups then you've got some you know zk snark stuff and then you've got layer twos like plasma and you guys have chosen solana which is like a layer two sort of scaling type blockchain for ethereum isn't it and that's kind of what it can do so that's one of the things but the cool thing about it is that in addition to being able to act in the same way a layer two with roll-ups would look like it's also a layer one protocol that can stand on its own yes 
And that's the big difference between it and something like Loopring or, or the other sort of layer two interfaces is that if you just ignore Ethereum, it, it's, you know, Solana is a blockchain. It has, you know, uh, 100 validators. It's, it's you know, and you it, it can last on its own with no, nothing sort of that it's attached to. And in fact, that means you can get this great user experience because you don't even need to interface with it from anything else. You can just go natively trade on Serum on Solana, and it's super fast. It takes you know, a second to finish an order. It costs a hundredth of a penny. So, so why um, why Solana? Yeah. We've had a lot of hype around oh, a number of sort of layer one chains. Oh yeah. And back in 2017, 18, the hype was all about transactions per second. Oh, you know, Zillica can do yeah. this. And now the conversation's changed a little bit to, well, who can complement Ethereum? Who's interoperable? That's where I feel the conversation is at the moment, isn't it? Right. So, and I think I'll say two things. The first is transactions per second still matters. It really matters. And, and it mattered in 2018 and it matters now. Um, and you know the sort of cool 2018 shit, which I think like EOS and Tron are like two examples of, you know, of like the sort of like things that were way faster than Ethereum back then, and 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 sort of hyped as Ethereum killers, and and actually did quite well, but didn't kill Ethereum. They like, you know, fell fell a step short of that. Um, were a lot faster than Ethereum. They're 50 to 100 times faster, and that's a lot. Um, it's enough that you can have an order book and a matching engine. It, it's really slow as far as an exchange goes. Yeah. Like, you know, you're getting like an order per second through for the entire world, which is still a hell of a lot better than ETH, which has something like an order per second for the entire ecosystem put together, as opposed to like one order book on one app on it. But so, so it's like fast enough to have an exchange, but it's like, you know, so, so we're on the borderline there. Um, Solana is yet another factor of 100 faster okay. than those. And so it's actually 10,000 times faster than Ethereum. And that second factor of 100 is pretty cool because it means that now you have like a market with 100 orders per second going through it, that's an actual exchange. You know, that's the sort of thing where you can like provide liquidity and like send orders without worrying too much about it. And uh, that's that's like, that's, that's actually super powerful. So maybe let's um, let's give people some more context about what this is so they can picture it at home and then we'll dive into some of those specs as well. So yeah. some of the different approaches we've seen, uh, the wrapped Bitcoin, and I think this wrapped term is kind of becoming synonymous with when we put things in an ERC-20 format and put them on other chains. And I think that's kind of the yeah. term we're going to start using naturally. But um, we've got something like BitGo that is a centralized custody where people deposit Bitcoins and then they go onto Ethereum. So that's a wrapped Bitcoin. And then you've got uh, REN or Republic Protocol trying to do it in a decentralized manner and they call that REN Bitcoin. So Synthetix is the third option where you just create a synthetic version of a Bitcoin as well. So what are the options? Yep. You guys are going for a decentralized one. How does it like wrapping it work on, on uh, Serum? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it uses something called optimistic rollups, which traditionally have been thought of as something between ETH and a layer two. Yeah. But really it's just ETH and it's any two chains. You can you can do rollups between. Yes. Um, and uh and so we're, we're doing them i mean between solana and, and everything else but ethereum sort of being the biggest and first one that we're going to be rolling out and what this is it's a way to basically let the two chains talk to each other and so it's a way that you can you know you can imagine one version where there's a cross-chain swap you're trying to swap a solana token for an ethereum based token and you want to do it atomically so like you make sure it's not like one person sends, the other person doesn't, and then that, that second person just lost their money. Um, but to do that, you need these chains talking to each other. You need the smart contracts on each side to know if the other person is sending. And there's sort of a similar version if you want to tokenize something. So you have, you know, Maker, MKR, and you want to put it on Solana. You can, sure, send it to an ETH smart contract, lock it up, try and then you have to mint on the Solana side, this little, like, wrapper on it. But it needs to know that this lockup happened and sort of vice versa. And so you know, basically in order to get this to work, you need the two chains to talk to each other. But if you can get that, if you can actually get them talking to each other, you basically have everything you can want. Because now it's almost just like one chain and, and you, you can sort of do perfect atomic swaps, perfect tokenization. You don't need councils of elders deeming what is, you know, what is like justified and what is not. Um, and the core cool thing about optimistic rollups, the thing that makes them work, is yes, Solana and Ethereum are two different chains that can't see each other. But you can just, like you, or like a node or, or, or Etherscan, can look at an Ethereum block and say like, yeah, I know how to read that. I know how to parse that. I know what happened. Um, which means it, it's just determined, like it's, it's a computer program. You know, you just sort of read what it says. But 
blockchains are also computer programs, so they can read this too. You can build a program in Solana, so you can just submit the entire history of the Ethereum blockchain, and it reads it, and it understands it, and vice versa. So if you can get the histories continuously sending on each side of this border, they know exactly what the other side is doing, and they can coordinate just as well as if they're on the same chain. So, again, for people at home that aren't familiar, an atomic swap is basically when, as Sam said then, both uh, chains commit to swap a certain amount of coins at a certain price, and once you can't send one without the other. So basically, as soon as you sign the message with the private key, the other key turns at the same time, and then they swap. Is that a good explanation for people at home? Yeah, that, that's basically right, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I really like that. How do you get around the problem of, say, if I want to swap Bitcoin and Bitcoin fees are high, or even ETH at the moment, with the sort of block times of the different chains? Yeah. So to some extent, you're fucked. I mean, if, if you want to have a transaction that involves an ERC-20 token, someone's paying a dollar for it, and you're waiting 15 minutes. Like, you, there's nothing you can do about yeah. it. That's how long it takes to clear an ERC-20 token transaction. So it, it's not, it doesn't solve all the problems in the world. But what it can let you do is, first of all, it can make it so that anyone can use Serum. You know, you can use it with the MetaMask if you want. One inch can plug into it. And so it, it sort of gets rid of the big downside of it not being on Ethereum. And it also means that if you want to, you can then just hop your tokens over once using this and then just interact with it natively in Solana. And then you don't have to wait for anything. So you're saying I, I, and, ideally people will sort of be in the ecosystem and once they're in there, everything gets gets fast and cheap. Yeah, exactly. And it'll be slow to get in, but no slower than your chain was anyway. And if you want, you can just pay that cost once to get your capital over, and then you can go do all the trading you want. And when you're done, you go home for the night, and move it back to Ethereum. And so that's a way that you can sort of like minimize the amount that you're paying that cost. What I'd love to see added to some of these products, like is the opposite of what say BitMEX do, where they dispatch all those transactions and clog the chain at the same time each day. Even as an FTX customer, I, I'd love to hear about the on-ramps and off-ramps, but say I want to deposit and I want to be in there in the next few hours or in the next day and you guys batch them or do them when the chain's a bit freer right. and those type of things. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, FTX just sort of eats the cost and just continuously shoots everything out. Um, so so it, it does constant withdrawals um, and it, it pays some money for that thing. It's worth it for the customer experience. You know, there is advantages to, to using chains when they're when they're not too busy. But actually with Ethereum, it's just some advantage, but the truth is network's just saturated. Like it's not that there's just peak demand, mm. it's that Ethereum can handle seven transactions per second and the world's trying to send way more than that. Yes. <laughs> and, and so it's just like, it, whenever you send it, it's gonna be expensive. Like, you know, you can do a little bit of, you can do some work by evening things out, but even if everything was evened out, it would still be slow and expensive. It's it just like the world is demanding more of it than it can provide. So was there any reason why you guys didn't do like just the optimistic rollups on, on Ethereum rather than the Solana route? Or is it... Right, so like with the layer two thing or something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what a lot of people do is instead of using Solana, they're like, all right, I'm gonna make Sam chain. It's my layer two thing. And it's whatever I say it is, but it's gonna have to report back to Ethereum. Yeah. And so there's gonna be rollups between it and Ethereum, which sort of keeps it honest and I have to keep reporting what happens every block. So why do we do this instead of that? First of all, um, if you do that, you're tethered to Ethereum and you can never be faster than it or cheaper than it. And it's in some important ways is every single fucking block, the entire thing is just goes back to Ethereum. And so that's, that's sort of one cost of it is that you lose this ability to just like have it be its own ecosystem. The other thing, is you sort of lose the ability to, to really judge what happens between Ethereum blocks. So the way most layer twos work, I mean, there's a lot of things you need to kind of try and get around this, but the problem basically is that like, the only thing that keeps it honest is the Ethereum blocks, which are kind of slow and expensive. And in between those, it's sort of doing whatever it, it does. There's no, not really much proof of that. And you can fuck around with things. Um, as long as you sort of, you know, come up with what you think happened by the time the next Ethereum block happened. If you use Solana, it's fully on chain like it is its own blockchain that you can read and verify and so you sort of for free get actually the full trust of everything that happened in real time or you know, on, on a hundred millisecond time scale yeah um without needing to rely on ethereum for that and so just like it's super powerful that i can live on its own as a chain without needing to just rely entirely on ethereum so, for, for for so much of what it does so how many solana nodes are there 
So there's like, uh, I think 150 right now and another 100 or two, which are transitioning to the main net. So yeah, um, that's- Which yeah. is, yep, it's, you know, how much is that? I, I don't really know how to think about that, what the right way to think about it is. On the one hand, it's it's smaller than some chains. On the other hand, it's like as decentralized as, as Ethereum miners are. You, and you can look at like, you know, you know, a fraction of, of, of power held by, you know, sort of each Solana uh, validator versus each Ethereum miner. And, and they, it looks like a pretty similar graph. I would definitely say that's good enough in my mind. Like if you say, oh, it's 21, like EOS, I'm saying, right. you know, no, that's that's not decentralized. But once right. you- Right, so at 21, you're also like, okay, well, I want to know more about this 21. Like how many of it is one person with 20, with like, you know, a lot of different hands. Yes. Um, but yeah, th this is definitely not that. Like this, you know, and you can go to SolanaBeach.io and and sort of check out uh, what you know what what all the validators are. Um, it's yeah, like there could be more, but it's sort of enough to be actually decent. So so changing gears, why do you think Binance Dex was basically a failure when we look at the volumes that they're doing compared to the growth in DeFi and all those exchanges? Right. And how do you guys want to sort of avoid that? It's a good question. And to be clear, like, I think there's a big danger for a while we're going to end up there. Like a lot of our intermediate plans looked a lot like that. Mm. Um, and I mean, I don't know, maybe we still will. I don't, you know, I, I can't see the future for sure, but here's, here's my story. Like, here, here's what I think. Um, and I think like, it's easy to end up in an unhappy middle here where you're like, all right, Ethereum's too slow. So we got to get faster. So you do something fairly fast, but not like super fast or super powerful and then you're like but but network is important so let's try and like get some networking effect while we're at it you get like a bit of networking effect with what we're doing and what you're left with is like a thing that it's not the thing everyone's going to use because the network's not where everything is and it's also like enough shittier than a centralized exchange that, that you're not going to use it if what you really care about is performance and you're sort of left with like i don't know who's the target customer for it you know and, and i think that's really the big problem with mind chains it's actually pretty cool like it's pretty fast it's an easy to use DEX, um, and it has a, a decent built-in network and user base. And and I think really the problem with it is just like I don't know, name the person hmm. who wants to use Binance DEX. Name the, name the person who both prefers it to Binance and prefers it to Uniswap. And I think there's like almost almost no one. Like the people who really want to use Uniswap are not going to think Binance DEX is legit and are not going to be happy that it doesn't plug into the Ethereum ecosystem. And the people who like don't care that much about that are going to be like. As long as I'm using Binance Dex, basically controlled by Binance anyway, why don't I just use Binance? Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's keep going, and I might share some thoughts on that as again at the end. But is this uh, to begin with just the order book for straight swaps? Are there plans to do options and other derivatives and expand oh, yeah. the universe? Yeah. And one of the really cool things about the way we're doing this is Solana's fast enough that it can handle all that. Like, it can handle a risk engine, it can handle synthetic expirations, it can handle derivatives, it can handle you know liquidations, creations, redemptions. Um, you know, liquidations on Ethereum are terrifying. Like, it takes like 15 minutes to liquidate someone when things are busy. Things can move a lot in 15 minutes, you know. So one of the reasons I, that on the Black Thursday, guys, when we had the big crash and Maker was trying to push through these transactions in Ethereum, was oh, yeah. that was devastating. So I'm guessing that um, Serum can't handle what we saw the other day if we have another huge big dump, but it's probably never going to have that many transactions compared to a centralized exchange. So what's sort of uh, out of interest, what was FTX doing the other day when we had the big big crash yeah so you know ftx has a lot of overkill for this and you look at ftx on an average day and its risk engine is ridiculously powerful it's stupid it makes no sense right yeah. it's like you know anyone can handle a like 2x leverage bitcoin perpetual position when bitcoin's moving a percent a day like that's just not hard um and ftx has like a four stage liquidation engine with backstop liquidity providers and like it pays attention to the ADVs it's trading in with the liquidation engine and like, you know, all this shit. Um, and, you know, a matching engine that can handle a, a ton of orders and stuff like that. And most days it's just sort of overkill and doesn't matter. But then you get to the huge days, the days either when Bitcoin moves 20% and trades $50 billion or the days when you've got people with 100x leveraged Dogecoin futures positions and it's moving 300%. Right. And then all of a sudden you've lost all of that slack that you had and every bit of overpoweredness that you had becomes absolutely essential. Yes. And, and that's basically the answer, which is total overkill on most days, which means that on the busiest days, it can still keep up. And, and then it's, it's sort of like on the busiest days, it's stretched to its limits. And it's like, you know, it can like just get by without having to worry about things like, you know, ADLing and stuff like that. 
Um, but I, I, you know, and the other day, that, that's only the other day the matching engine performed as it was meant to, wasn't it? It was just the front end had a bit of lag. I was trading at the time, but the matching oh, yeah. engine executed. The matching engine was the back end was totally fine. It was we had a fucking PNL query running, so we finally fixed a lot of things about the PNL process. And embarrassingly, um, we we're backfilling the data for 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 everyone for like you know a year's worth of PNL history, including spot PNL, yeah. which is finally basically functional. Okay. Um, and we're not paying enough attention to it, and it's taking up like eighty percent of the the, the the network. Uh, so we had to kill that process to 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 to, to, to unstick the front end. But um, but you know the the matching engine and risk engine were were fine. Um, and uh, and in fact, like we had parameters that were way too conservative for backstop liquidity, well, liquidity fretters, but. It, after taking those up, we had another factor of ten or so to spare. Yeah, no, I was. In, um, in I, I had a short on because I'd been tweeting about four hundred dollars Ethereum, and and then it dumped, <laughs> and I was hitting close, and it wasn't. But then once the dust settled, yeah. it, it had executed, so that was good. Okay, so yeah, no, sorry about the, the little hiccup there. No, that's all right. That's all right. I think most of our audience are on FTX now, which is which is good. So <laughs> let's dive into the yeah. uh, Serum token itself how much has been raised so far. So one of the problems in the past with these early seed rounds, and I've got no problem with discounts if early investors are taking more risk and that type of thing. But what we wanted to avoid was these guys that are getting in a month before everyone else at huge discounts and then sort of dump on retail. So do you want to talk about all the things that you've put in place to avoid all that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this is something that I didn't know uh, two years ago and something I've just sort of learned and finally sort of gotten right with Serum, which is, you know, and I actually wrote up a thread about this today, um, uh, which y'all can check out on Twitter, which is basically like, why do VCs exist? Why do you even have them? Yes. Like, and, and, and I think often the answer is that they, they're stupid. They didn't make any sense in that case. Mm. You just gave them free money and you did, or you, your users did, or someone did. Yeah. Like they made money and they provide no value and it had to come from somewhere. And, and, and so I think that whenever you, you take investment, you have to answer the question of like, why am I doing this? Why is this positive sum? Why is this going to help the project? And sometimes the answer is you fucking need the funding. And if that's the case, it should be long-term and it should be pre-product mm. or pre-revenue. And it should be like, yeah, we're needing to build for another year or two before we have a revenue product and we're going to bankrupt in six months. So we got to fix that somehow. So yeah, we'll give them some equity cheap and in return, our company won't go under. Mm. That's one fine reason to do it. That's not the reason we did it, but but that makes a of, of sense. Um, the, the other reasons, well, if you can get someone who's really going to be part of the ecosystem for the long term and fighting for it and helping to build it out and and get other projects on it that can be really powerful i mean a, a really powerful advocate is just worth a ton um and uh and, and sort of really powerful public player in the ecosystem yeah i was just um, just to give people some context and, as well so when, when we were in 2017 18 we're talking to a lot of projects and in australia for example there's not a lot of appetite from venture capital investors and they and banks even in Australia don't want to take risk they're all about lending the next mortgage so that idea of crowdfunding and getting it from around the globe that's a really powerful idea that's why I like the ICO or the IEO idea um, as Sam was saying then yeah yeah and 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 I think yeah the thing you just have to ask yourself why am I doing this and and e am I structuring it in a way where it's going to get me what I want and if you want funding, great, you know, get the funding you need and you're going to be paying a high price for it, but it's maybe it's worth it. Um, if, if that's not what you're doing, if, if you're just doing a seed round shortly before launch, why do it? It's to get partners, long-term partners, you know? And so what's that mean? It means you should be selecting people who have something real to add to the ecosystem. And it means that you should probably be locking them up for a while because the whole point is that they're going to be partners for the long-term. They shouldn't mind getting locked up. And it sort of just reinforces that that's what they're there for. And if they really hate it, there should be alarm bells going off in your head of like, why don't they want this? Oh, it's because they want to sell and, I, and then be done with this. And I'm not sure. And I, that's not what I wanted. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, Sam, as you're saying, you've just been learning more about this recently. But in, in that world, a lot of the time, these VC investments will be locked up for things like five years. Whereas in the crypto world, some of these projects were promising to build something in one, two, three, or even five years, but the tokens are freely traded from day one. So they see the price go down 99%, but in a normal market, they, the shares or the tokens wouldn't even be liquid or be allowed to be traded. So that's kind of, again, something that I think a lot of people just don't understand in the crypto uh, ecosystem. Yeah, I, I t totally agree. And and again, short, like not locking up tokens is fine if that's what your goal is. If your goal is you need funding, the tokens aren't going to list for a year, and that's what you need the funding for, then you know, you're paying a price, but sometimes you have to pay that. And, and you doing it with your eyes open. But 
don't do it just do the vc things that's what you do you know yeah. and and with serum that's very much not what we're doing every single seed sale was locked up entirely for the first year and then unlocks linearly over the six years after that it's like a really long unlock schedule by crypto standards for tokens yeah and super long for a token that's listing like tomorrow it's not like it's not going to list for four years um and and the reason is that like we want long-term partners and you know if we said told the vc hey one seven year unlock schedule they're like that's too long we're like great glad we had this conversation uh looks like we got to the truth here pretty quickly which is that this is not a partnership that makes sense and we can both move on with our lives and your partners and, are yeah. some fantastic ones genesis block three commas multi-coin capital parify so trusted names in the space yeah yeah i mean it's it's i've you know really liked working with them and it's not it's not a coincidence you know these are the people who reach out to us and who we reached out to you know as soon as we started uh building this because they're you know people who we want to work with and who want to work with us and so that that's sort of how we thought about uh about the seed sale from from day one and i'm, I'm sort of super glad that that we did so what's the that you've raised around 20 mil to give it an 80 mil valuation on day one and then over the end of the six seven years that would give it a fully diluted 800 mil valuation is that right yep that that's about right although actual circulating is going to be substantially lower than than either of those yes cool and so that's uh around is that eight cents so i'm just trying to figure out what is the token sale going live for is that 11 yep. cents and how does that bidding system work who can participate yeah, totally true. yeah. yep so so just high level you know the the sort of end of the seed sale is is eight eight something cents eight and a half cents something like that and that's for the one to seven year locked tokens and then the io which is going to be happening tomorrow night is going to be like 10 to 11 cents plus possibly some some exchange tokens thrown in depending on you know what how much demand there is and, and where it prints um and and and, and you know i think when we we're thinking about that we want to be sort of you know obviously higher than the seed sale from the seed investors and they're earlier but only by a few weeks but more importantly they're taking a seven-year lockup and the io is going to be unlocked in three days when, when it lists on, on on the exchanges uh four days whatever so so that that that's pretty different. Um, but we also didn't want it to be like a twenty x difference. That's sort of like something's fucked. Mm. If if there's a twenty x difference, they're like, you know, one of those numbers is wrong. Absolutely, so. absolutely. So um, one of the things that I was a bit surprised about, or maybe I've just missed this, was if we go back to Binance, I had that a lot of people had the same thesis as me, but I think we were pretty early on the time when BNB was like four dollars, and I said this is going to cause bnb to do an ethereum type run here if, if all these crowd raisers need the bnb token right and then all the other exchange tokens followed suit so why did you guys not say the only way you can raise in this is ftt token i, th I would have thought that was a big, big catalyst right. so how's all that work so totally hear you so for one thing there is an ftt token component to this and any ftt tokens that that we do collect from this are going to be burned ah. and so it's it's not even us raising but it's, you know we're we're decreasing supply and serve for turning that value to the FTT token holders. Yeah. Um, and, you know, why is this? It's IO hysteria has sort of died down. I mean, it's a lot less manic than it was before. And the truth is holding an IO and FTT versus USD, it's not that different. Like, you know, what's the difference really between users buying FTT, paying for an IO with it versus users paying dollars and we use those dollars to buy FTT? Or like alternately, if we sell FTT at the end, then it's just as if they paid with dollars. So if you don't burn the FTT, it's just not that different than paying with dollars anyway. Yeah. So it's you know either either just make it dollars or make it burnt FTT, which is an actual different economic situation there. Um, and and so we sort of went went with like splitting the difference between having some of each of. It's those. a bit like uh, it's all good for Ethereum on the way up, but then when EOS start dumping four billion dollars of Ethereum on the way down, it drives down the token just as much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anything else you want to mention, Sam? I think that's basically oh, other things that SRM token does. So we've got the, uh, you can lock up a million tokens to create a, what they call a, a mega serum, is it? And that's like a staking node. And yep. do you want to explain how that all works? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, there's there's going to be yield. Everyone wants yield, so we're going to have yield. It's going to be economically reasonable yield, though. This is going to be like, you know, 5-ish percent, not like, you know, 80 um yeah. and uh and, and and you know the way it's going to work is you can stake your serum uh and if you stake it then it's it's i, I think there's like a one week one week lock up on that or something like that cool down um and and you know you get you get uh airdropped uh serum for, for doing so um and uh in addition to that you stake to a node so so if you're staking you choose whatever node you want 
or you can try and start your own node and see if you can get people to stake to you. Um, and each node sort of acts as a unit to perform some functions on the Serum ecosystem. And one of the biggest ones, if you go back to that cross-chain protocol of the optimistic rollups, one of the steps I didn't explain there is somehow each of the different smart contracts needs to figure out what the other chain is doing. Like someone has to hand it the history of the other chain. Mm -hmm. Once it has that, it can sort of like figure out what it means, but it has to get it somehow. And that's one of the duties of nodes to sort of sit there dutifully, like passing back and forth blockchain histories. And you would want that to get up to a couple of hundred of those nodes like we we're talking about before, wouldn't you? Yeah. Ideally, but the beautiful thing about that one is that if lots of people submit different histories, um, the, the, the blockchain can actually figure out which is right and which is bullshit. Yeah. Just like you can, right? You throw out the ones that are incorrectly formatted and then you take the longest chain. That's the definition of the right blockchain. And you know a smart contract can do that too. So you don't actually need every node to be honest. In fact, you only need a single node to have it shit together. And so it's sort of a, a little bit of overkill by the time you have like a thousand nodes all doing this, but of course they're not all gonna do it. Some are gonna be down on their game, things like that. Um, and so, uh, so you know, that's gonna be one of the node duties is sort of submitting correct blockchain histories. Also a slightly trickier, but similar thing of like calling bullshit if someone lies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if someone, if there's a, some sort of swap going on, someone fails to deliver, there's going to be collateral locked up, so they can't get away with it as long as anyone catches them. Yeah. Now, again, theoretically, you as a person sending tokens cross-chain could just be doing all this yourself. You could be submitting all the right histories and guaranteeing everything works. But maybe you're asleep. And so, you know, then sort of the nodes are the backstop for that. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of other similar functions that they that they sort of perform, and they, they get reward more depending on how well they perform at that. Um, and that brings us to Mega Serum. So Mega Serum, which is, I think, the the thing I'm proudest of in my life is coming up with the idea of the Mega Serum. Yeah. Um, Sounds like a transformer, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's not that important, but it's, it's just super cool. Uh, so Mega Serum is a, a million serum put together. Yeah. You can take a million serum and you, you can lock them up and, and get a Mega Serum. Yeah. And you take a Mega Serum, you can crack it open, get a mil million serum out. And it's basically like carrying a million serum around. Like you get all the benefits of a million serum. Except you get a little bit more, so you get like even lower fees than if you had a million serum. And on top of that, every node has to have at least one mega serum yes. staking to it. And and so, yeah, each node needs ten million serum, don't they? To that's yeah, right, yeah. which is the equivalent of ten me mega serums, but it could be you know nine million mega serums and nine million serum and a mega serum. And the other thing though, now now you say, okay, why is an effort to turn all their serum into mega serum? The answer is they're scarce. There can only be a thousand mega serum, which is only enough for 10% of all the serum to turn into mega serum. So there's there's you know there's there's a limit on it. It's basically always going to be at that hard cap. And so uh you can freely redeem them but you you can only create them if if a slot opens up. Uh other which makes them oh, sorry you you're right. Oh no, it's saying which makes you know a little bit more sort of rare. Yeah. I was going to say other things uh so governance um you've got the buy and burn model again 100% of net revenue. So we're starting to see the DEXs do some pretty big volumes in terms of you know tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. So how would that work? Like, it would be a problem where you could be too successful if you're burning 100% of net revenue? Right. So, uh, you know, it is going to be 100% of net revenue. And, and the reason is uh, there's no company here. Like, it, it's all, this is a DeFi project. It's all the token. Yeah. The token gets everything. And, uh, and I mean, I, I certainly hope we're too successful. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Uh, but you know, this is I mean, that the token is going to get to vote on what to do with the, the revenue and whether it wants to, you know, airdrop some of it on nodes, just send it all to the buy and burn, um, or or what have you. Um, but uh, but in the end, you know, the serum token sort of gets gets you know the ultimate stake to 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 you know control and and benefits of 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 the serum ecosystem. Fantastic. Uh, I think that's basically the overview that I really wanted to give people at home. We've touched on all the important points. Anything else you'd want to add there, Sam? We haven't spoken about. I yeah. I mean, it's it, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just show one more thing, which is just a little bit cool here for people who haven't seen it. Um, and this is just a. Uh, hopefully soon I'll be able to show a demo of of uh, Serum itself. Uh, the back end is actually of the first initial piece of this is, is sort of done but there's there's work hooking up to GUIs right now so you can't see anything yeah, all right. um i guess i was going to say the, the um, team is there any execution like track record and who's the sort of i know it's kind of decentralized so there's no team but there is yeah. a team so how does all that work right yeah. so it, it's a group of people i mean a lot of them are, are sort of myself and, and and the teams i've been working with uh you know i'll meet in ftx 
in addition that the Solana team's been working really nonstop on building out support for this. Um, there's a lot of groups that are building out, you know, a lot of wallet providers are building out support for Solana tokens. Um, and a lot of, you know, third party trading apps are, are starting to get integrated with, with Serum and Solana. And, and we're just seeing a bunch of people sort of falling out of the woodwork here um, to help work on various pieces of this ecosystem, um, which is, uh, which is, is, you know, super cool. So for most people at home, um, the easiest way, if they're interested, is going to be through FTX, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, FTX is definitely going to be like a, a pretty easy way, but we're going to have a GUI coming out soon. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of in, in development and, you know, plugging things into each other right now, but, but hopefully soon I'll be able to show people, uh, you know, what that looks like. And I, I'm pretty, and for people at home, uh, guys, GUI good, but... graphical user interface, where hopefully you can plug it, uh, plug yes. in your ledger, your Trezor or whatever it is, and start to interact with this new platform protocol. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm super, uh, super excited to actually be able to, to show that to people. Um, there's maybe one last thing that I'll do, which is just to give sort of a visceral sense of uh of of what the difference is between what platform you build on and and you know why what serum's going to be able to do because i think everyone says big numbers i mean everyone launches an exchange like this has three bajillion transactions per millisecond like this can compute more atoms than are in the universe yeah. um and and i mean who the fuck knows what any of that means um but hey, there's a super cool demo which uh the solana team made that just sort of uh just shows like what the real throughput is of the Solana network, and 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 and, and I thought maybe I'd just screen share that with people, just to give a sense of of what we're really talking about here. And so let me. Uh, you know how to give share. A here. You just click on share yeah. screen down the bottom. Yeah, I see you the it? button. I'm just trying to. Which which screen does that share? If I do it, uh, it'll ask you. Which, it'll bring up the which ones you, you, you want right. to share. Then just yep. yeah. All right, cool. So give me a second here to get that up and then um there we go. This is the one. All right. So you guys should see a break right now. Yeah. And you guys can do this at, at home too. If you just go to break.solana.com. You can do it on mainnet too if you happen to have some Solana lying around to send to it uh for transaction fees. I mean a very small amount of it. Yeah. Um but if not you can do testnet and and so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to send some transactions on Solana. Each one of these, well, you, you'll see these boxes. You'll see what this means in a sec. Each box is a transaction, so the equivalent of like you know sending an order on Uniswap or something. Yeah. And when it's black, that means you've sent it, and when it's green, that means it's fully confirmed and fully finalized and settled. Um, and so I'm just going to going to and, and every time I touch a key on my keyboard, it's going to send a new transaction. That that's how this works. And so I can sort of, you know, we'll see what happens if I type nonsense very quickly. Okay. So here we go. And um, and I know the screen's like a little bit laggy here, but and when, when I'm typing, trust me, it's it's not beautiful prose here. It's it's random keys, but 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 what you can see here is every single box here is a transaction. And um, I sent I just sent 619 transactions on the Solana network in. 15 seconds um so so that that's what that's something like 40 per second yeah and uh, as a comparison the entire ethereum network put together sends about seven per second mm. so i just mashing buttons sent like six times as much as the entire ethereum network can handle in terms of throughput um it took two seconds on average to get final confirms on each of these and you could see that the boxes are just turning green basically immediately yeah. and I was using uh, less than a tenth of a percent of the Solana network's capacity doing that. And that just gives you a sense for like what it means to be that much faster and and why it is that like Serum's going to be able to have an actual exchange and matching engine and order book all fully on chain while, you know, most Texas right now, you know, can't have any of those because it takes three minutes to send just a single transaction. And and so that that's sort of like the the, the, the difference here. Absolutely. Um, no, I think uh, I've really enjoyed that. Um, guys, I'll probably, yeah, in, for, in my group, I'll share some more thoughts on this when I post the video, but I really appreciate you being the first guest on, uh, I think we're going to call it Nuggets Grill. You didn't get grilled too much, Sam, because I think we had a good 
conversation about some interesting yep. tech. And I think probably the biggest sticky point for me was, as you said, where does this product fit between a fantastic FTX exchange and these other DEXs and like who's the customer and what are the products they want? And I don't think we quite know that yet. There's a lot of people launching options and derivatives and trying different styles, but it's the fastest growing space space and we know it's a uh, well quadrillion dollar market of derivatives so i think there's plenty of uh, market share to go around yeah i totally agree and i'm super excited to see where it leads awesome well uh, i hope you guys have enjoyed that and um i'll put some links to more information down below and thanks for joining us sam thank you cheers guys